Here's a quick and easy stoichiometry lesson. First, we're going to find the mass of some very fine, super fine actually, steel wool, which I'm going to assume is made of pure iron. I'm going to take a piece of this and I'm going to open it up and place it in the beaker. Find the mass of the iron. All right, I'm going to line the inside of the beaker this and find that initial mass ten point five three seven grams I'm going to go ahead and light this steel wool on fire uh, while the steel wool is burning I'm going to supply it with a fresh source of oxygen by blowing it with a hair dryer set on the low setting I'm not going to directly blow the hair dryer onto the steel wool because that will make it burn too vigorously. I'll carefully uh, blow from an angle and if it just gets too hot I'll just remove the uh, hair dryer uh, until things calm down and uh, I don't want to get too many sparks. So here we go. Get this lit, get it burning, set my hair dryer on low. And I'm trying to completely burn the steel wool, but not produce too many sparks that exit the beaker. And as the reaction calms down, I can get the hair dryer closer and closer to ensure that all of the steel wool has reacted. The beaker's now quite hot, so don't handle this with your hands. You're going to need tongs to take it to the balance. At this point, though, it's instructive to ask your students, do you think the mass of the steel wool has gone up, has gone down, or has it remained the same? Let's take it to the balance and find out. Okay, we're now going to find out if our steel wool has changed in mass. I'm going to handle this with tongs because it's still hot from the reaction. And you'll notice that the mass has gone up. This is a surprising result for a lot of people. A lot of people will think that when you burn the steel wool because it's burned, the mass will go down. But you have to remember that in this reaction, iron is combining with oxygen from the atmosphere. And that oxygen is being chemically bound to the iron. And that oxygen is what's responsible for the increase in mass. We're going to go with 14.062 grams. We're going to go ahead and analyze the results of our experiment. You might remember that we produced some iron oxide by burning some steel wool. It's inter interesting to look at the difference between the two. I mean, there's the steel wool, which has a, a nice gray color whereas the iron oxide has kind of got like a, I notice a bluish black color. So we can tell that there's a chemical change that, that's occurred. We're going to go ahead and analyze this stoichiometrically. We know that we started with iron. Well, we assumed that from the steel wool. And we know that we started with 10.537 grams of iron. We produced iron oxide, and we don't know the ratio of iron to oxygen in the iron oxide. That's actually what we're going to try to solve for. But we know the mass of the iron oxide. That came out to 14.062 grams. Now, the difference in this mass is simply the mass of the oxygen that was bound to the iron as a result of the reaction. So if I take 14.062, and subtract 10.537, I can find the mass of oxygen that's in the iron oxide. This minus this gives me 3.525 grams of oxygen. Now what we're really after here 
is the molar ratio of iron to oxygen in the iron oxide. Well, I can't compare moles by looking at grams, so let's go ahead and convert these masses to moles. So for iron, it's going to look like this. I know I started with 10.537 grams of iron. I see that if I multiply, excuse me, if I divide the grams of iron by the molar mass of iron, 55.85 grams of iron is one mole, then I can convert grams of iron into moles of iron. If I do that math, it comes out 0.1887 moles of iron. Let's do the same thing for oxygen. Well, I have 3.525 grams of oxygen in the iron oxide that I collected. I see that if I divide this by 16 grams per mole, that's the molar mass of oxygen, 16 grams of oxygen is a mole of oxygen, then I will convert my grams of oxygen into moles of oxygen. 3.525 divided by 16 comes out to 0 0.2203 moles of oxygen. <clears throat> so I now have my molar ratio of iron to oxygen in the compound. Oh, there we go, 0.1887 moles of iron for every 0.2203 moles of oxygen. Now it might surprise you that this doesn't come out at a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. Well, it turns out that iron oxide is what we call a non-stoichiometric compound. There are some compounds that uh, don't follow a perfect whole number stoichiometry, and iron oxide happens to be one of these compounds. It is often the case that iron oxides are going to be are going to be found in the ratio of, on the low side, 0.84 irons to every oxygen, all the way up to on the high side, about 0.95 moles of iron for every oxygen. Let's see where our compound fits, or the one that, that we measured in this, in this range. Well, to do so, I'm just going to divide both of these numbers by 0 0.2203. Of course, 0 0.2203 divided by 0 0.2203 is 1. So my ratio of oxygen, of course, is going to be 1. And then compared to that, 0 0.1187 divided by 0 0.2203, that comes out to 0 0.86, which falls nicely within the range of expected possibilities. What that tells me is that the iron oxide we produced probably contains both some iron 2 and some iron 3. In iron 2, we would expect a perfect 1 to 1 stoichiometry to balance the charges. So we would expect one iron for every oxygen. If it was iron 3, then we would expect two irons for every three oxygens, or about, what that be, two-thirds, so that's going to be about 0.67 irons for every one oxygen. We find that we're somewhere in the middle of that, which tells me that the compound we produce probably contains some iron 3 as well as some iron 2.